Now, you may have heard that Dragon Ball Z fighters, when they need more time before a big battle, use something called the hyperbolic time chamber. And it is a way to get more time relative to the rest of the world. It's in a different dimension. When they enter the hyperbolic time chamber, they can train for an entire year while only a single day passes outside. Now, they use what's called time dilation, which is a real concept in physics as we know it, but the way that the hyperbolic time chamber in DBZ works doesn't really make sense. Time dilation is when your clock, your physical, biological clock, everything about you, your space time, slows down relative to the rest of the universe. So if you were undergoing time dilation, you would age less than someone outside of your traveling would. This happens in the International Space Station. You're going so fast that your biological clock is actually ticking more slowly than everyone else on Earth. So you can't go into a chamber for a year and only have a day pass on Earth if you're using realistic time dilation. But it could work in reverse. If you were inside of a spaceship, and you left the Earth, and you wanted to experience this kind of effect, if you went a velocity, a fraction of the speed of light C here, you get, use this equation for time dilation to see how much time will pass for you versus everyone else outside of you. So you get on a spaceship, and then you go 0 0.99999 9626, almost exactly, C. And if you go that speed for one day, then the rest of the world will have, the rest of the universe rather, will have aged a year by the time that you stop. It's not exactly the way that Dragon Ball Z works, but it is a physics and sciencey way to maybe preserve the, the, the youth and the strength of heroes while time passes otherwise. It's actually been used in sci-fi novels like Ender's Game and Interstellar. Hey, and welcome to another edition of Because Science Live, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all of your comments, questions, corrections, and attempted stumps of me and try to answer them live here in the void. I'm not sure where I am, but I'm ready for your questions. That's what I am sure of. So I have occasional voice of the void here. Nate? Nate? Yep. Oh, what do we have first? From John S. Mm. Kyle, is it possible for a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier to hover in the air like the Avengers helicarrier? A lot of people ask me about the helicarrier. So um, I, uh, I haven't done this math myself, but uh, the helicarrier looks something like, let's just be very general, the helicarrier looks something like this in the Avengers with very large fans, but how large would they have to be to lift something like an aircraft carrier? Now, I again, I, I haven't done this math myself, but um, a blogger at Wired named Rhett Elaine, uh, who's a physics professor who has had a blog with Wired forever, calculated that each fan, more or less, would have to be the size of the entire helicarrier four of those just to lift it off of the ground. That's because the thrust you can get from a fan like that isn't nearly on the same level as how much an aircraft carrier weighs. So the helicarrier would, could stay the same size, but the fans would have to get a lot bigger. Yeah, this thrust problem is the same reason why uh, dragons would have to have a gigantic wingspan, bigger than anything you've ever seen in any media uh, ever, because if they are wearing, weighing as much as a Tyrannosaurus Rex, the wingspan to generate uh, enough lift and the muscles and the size of the muscles that the that the monster would need would be so big uh, would be so big that the wingspan would increase uh, cr crazily. The dragon's wings would blot out the sky. Um, what are we talking about? Helicarrier looks like that. What's next? From Timur Sh Shah. Sorry. Hey, we've, he's, he's, uh, he or she has commented on footnotes before, I believe. Could Johnny Storm survive falling in lava? Mm. Could Flame Boy survive falling in lava? Um, <sighs> that's a hard question. I have no idea. I, I, he, the surface of his body is engulfed in flame. 
Um, and uh, the surface temperature of lava, or you know, if you put your hand right next to the surface of lava, I think it's around two to two and a half thousand degrees Fahrenheit, which is incredibly hot. It's hot enough to um, ignite things that get close to it. If Johnny Storm is already ignited, I, bel I, I don't see why that additional heat would do much to him. Um, so, like we've uh, like we've said before on this show, if you because uh, because lava is stone, if you had, let's say, some lava on top of a surface, and then you had, uh oh, and then you had Johnny Storm laying on top of it or falling into lava because uh, stone uh, because uh, the lava is theoretically much denser because it's made out of stone than a human, which is made out of mostly water, uh, the stone, hey look, I'm drawing Goku's hair. Uh, the, the stone is three times more dense than the water that makes up most of your body, and so Johnny Storm would could float on the surface of lava and lounge around like he was at a hot pool party. Yeah, sure, what's next? From Park Ranger Moon, Park Ranger Mon, excuse me. If there is a person the size of a planet, what would the gravity well look like? If a person was the size of a planet. Well, one thing that separates um, planets from non-planets, like Pluto, deal with it, is that if a planetary body gets big enough, if a planetary body gets big enough, it has enough mass, the force, the omnidirectional force of gravity, all pointing towards the center of that mass, will compress, will force, um, will act to force that object down into the shape of a sphere, or close to it. The Earth isn't a perfect sphere, but it gets close. It's an oblate spheroid. Um, but when a body gets, uh, it's one of the criteria for uh, being a planet. It's not the only one, it's one of three. But when a body gets big enough, its gravity acts to compress it down into a sphere because gravity acts from all directions pointing into a central point, which would form a sphere, geometrically speaking. So, if a person was big enough, had, had enough mass to be a planet, I would guess that gravity would act to crush their bodies down into a spherical mass of guts. And then uh, what was that, whatever was at the center of that, let's say their pelvis would start to turn and uh, heat up into plasma, and you'd have a, you'd die. It would die. That, the thing would die. And it'd be gross. It would be a meat planet. <laughs> Which I do not want to go to, unless it's, nope, can't say that. What's next? From Alex Rowan. Mm. Hey Kyle, not to be cliche, uh -huh. but big fan. Mm -hmm. What science question do you get most, and what science question are you most sick of getting? This one. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> what, what science question am I most sick of getting? Um... I don't. I, I'm never really annoyed by the questions that I'm asked. I, uh, you know, it's it's not easy to go back through repeated explanations. But every time I do uh, try to re-explain something, I feel like I get better at it, and I'm learning it more myself. So I'm not smarter than any of you. I'm just trying to learn this stuff along with you in a fun and interesting way. Uh, so uh, I don't think I'm I'm sick of explaining anything. The the things that annoy me are more uh, the the blatant. Um, misconceptions about some things in science or uh, denials of things about science. That's, that's more of what gets my goat. Um, but thank you for that question that I've heard of before. What's next? From Aiden Ray. Hey Kyle, at San Diego Comic Con live stream, you said ways on how Superman and Flash could kill people like jerks. Yeah. What is another fun example of how a hero could just be really rude? How a hero could... Yeah, yeah. So at, at, uh, at San Diego Comic-Con, thank you for watching if you were there or if you were watching the stream, uh, I said that there are a lot of ways that superheroes could uh, dispatch of you or an enemy in a really weird way uh, that would be very depressing. So the Flash, I said, could um, grab you by the shirt collar and slowly accelerate you so you didn't die up to light speed, let's say, and the speed force takes care of friction and so you don't get obliterated by the atmosphere. He, he could hold on to you and run at light speed for this. Let's say he runs at this speed, 
close to light speed for a couple of days with him, like, oh, please let go. And, you're like, and he's like, fine. He lets go of you. And when he lets go of you, enough time has passed that everyone you ever knew and ever loved was dead because of old age. That would be a terrible thing to do to a person. Or Superman <laughs> could just grab you by the shirt collar. I don't know why. And because, oh, he, he grab your wrist. And because he's so strong, you're never going to get away from him, right? So he just grabs your wrist and uh, he stands there until, until you die. You just <laughs> like go. Or he, he grabs your ankle and he slowly, like one foot per second, just brings you up into space. <laughs> that would be terrible as well. Um, but what would be really bad? Um, uh, Nightcrawler uh, teleporting into where your body is. Or, hmm, Ant-Man could do the same. Or, uh, huh, Scarlet Witch could make you do terrible, terrible things. Um, same thing with Thor's hammer, if you put it like on your foot and just left. <laughs> and that's it. Be, be t terrible ways to go. See, the, these, these ways to be dispatched are not very cinematic, but they, I think they are accurate. I can think up of a few more. Maybe I'll make it into an episode. Hey, what's next? From Jonathan Reed. Oh, hello, Jonathan. What does it take to vaporize the human skeleton? Um, so there's a couple definitions of vaporize. I think the popular term uh, vaporization is just to kind of turn you into a cloud. Just tss, It's kind of like disintegration. But if you wanted to get more technical, vaporizing would be turning something into vapor. So how much energy would it take to first heat up? Let's, let's just be very general. How much energy would it take to first heat up and then boil and disperse all of the water in your body? So you can do this math. You can assume the average weight of, an, uh, the average weight of a male is 62 kilograms on this planet. You could take 62, 62 kilograms worth of water and use uh, specific heat of water uh, or specific energy and then uh, calculate how, much, how many joules of energy you would have to put into that water to first heat it up to its boiling point and then to vaporize it, which takes a little bit more energy called the latent heat of enthalpy. Heat of vaporization. Let's just say that. <laughs> I think that's an e the easier one. Um, and then you get the total value. Now, I, I'm doing this off the top of my head, but I believe that value gets close to something. Uh, I, I, th I haven't done this calculation in a while, but I've done it. It's in the range of a few gigajoules or a few billion joules, um, which is around the value that is in a typical lightning bolt. So in theory, if all of the energy of a lightning bolt went into you, it would do what it does to trees. That's why trees explode. It's the, the, the water is rapidly heated and expanded into gas. And as that gas expands, it produces a pressure which forces the tree apart and kind of explodes it because it, go, it happens so quickly. So if all the energy of a lightning bolt did that to you, you would probably vaporize in some, uh, in, in a way that say like, wow, that guy was totally disintegrated. But uh, in reality, what would happen is that the, you know, electricity finds a way through your body to a ground and then uh, not all the energy is going into you, and so people can get struck by lightning without vaporizing because not all the energy is going into them. It's going rather through them, kind of like a channel. Um, but around this, maybe, I think. I wrote an article about it once called um, How Much Energy Does It Take to Vaporize a Human? <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's very straightforward. But I think it's around this value. Uh, and also, if you've ever gone to engineering school, you have been warned uh, that if there is a flash over in the electrical system that you're working in, you can basically be vaporized. And they showed us pictures. So I take it pretty seriously. <laughs> Whoa, anyway, what's next? From Matterbeam. Sup, MB. Hi, nice shave. Thank you my for question, noticing. <laughs> my question is, will you do an episode on the, Aqu the Aquaman movie trailer? Uh, yeah, so I'm planning on doing an Aquaman episode, yeah, even though I just shaved. Uh, I can dig it. <laughs> but I think it would probably be closer to the film's release just because, you know, 
you know how media works. You, you create content, you put it closer to when something comes out so it gets more views. I can dig it. Um, so, uh, but what I will probably end up doing is how Aquaman's uh, biology and physiology would have to change in order to accommodate living under the sea. Oop, gotta be careful, we cannot afford music in the void. Uh, I would probably do it on what about Aquaman would have to change for a humanoid person who's m mostly naked all the time to exist under water and under ocean water. And uh, he'd look a bit different. I'll say that. I've been, I've been holding on to this idea for a while, but it's going to be something like that. Thank you for your question, buddy. What's next? From Death by a Melons. Oh, wait. Okay. So how high would you have to drop a melon to Probably not that high. I mean, a, a good melon, a good, uh, what is it? What are, what are the orange ones? Cantaloupes. A good cantaloupe is what? I don't know. Under like two kilos, something like that. Drop two kilos from, hmm, I don't know, 20 meters, something like that. It'd be going fast enough to really wreck you, I think. Anyway, uh, any, what, what's next? What? Oh, sorry. Death My Melon says. What would happen if I threw the majority of the population into a black hole? Hey, you doing all right? <laughs> um, the majority of the population. Do you mean, who are you sparing and why? That's what I want to know. What would happen if you just, uh, since you didn't give me a percentage or anything, what would happen if you threw all of humanity into a black hole? Uh... Uh, in, 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 in terms of what? Uh, I mean, it, black holes are so massive. They have solar level masses. They're, they're, they're very, very massive. If you threw all of humanity into it, it wouldn't change the mass of it uh, much at all. I mean, there's, there's, uh, in terms of biomass, there's about the same number of ants. In, in mass as there are humans. It's, it's not a crazy amount of mass. Uh, so if you added it to a black hole, it wouldn't change its lifespan very much. Um, I don't know if it would... Okay, wait. So <laughs> if you had... Oh, man. If you had... Uh, let's say you had a black hole, which is actually a sphere, because a hole in three dimensions, if you look at it from every direction, it's a sphere. That's how we know that... Earth is round because it would be a disk if it was on the moon when an eclipse, whatever. So if you had a black hole, which is a black sphere, as we said, <laughs> and you, and you uh, took all of humanity and you rocketed them at a very specific velocity and trajectory, and you had all these people all going towards a black hole, oh no, what's happening? you would um, create a people accretion disk where people's bodies would start hitting each other so hard and so fast that they'd uh, first turn into meat slush and then they'd turn into plasma and then um, they'd start to glow. And then there would be a glowing meat ring around a black hole made out of the crushed bodies of everyone who's ever been. Is that what you're thinking? I hope not. What's next? What's next? Wow, I'm getting dark on this one. From Blake Heeman. Blake Heeman? Do you have the power? Just keep going. Hey Kyle, what's the difference between hovering over water and land? Is water treated like a solid plane? Do waves have to be taken into account? Oh, that is a very, very complicated question. What is the difference between hovering? Let's say you had a not a Marty McFly hoverboard, but you had uh, turbines, some, some, some form of thrust, let's just like a helicopter. What's the difference between flying over? Okay, so maybe I'll answer it this way. It's kind of a, maybe, maybe you don't have this misconception, uh, but I think many do. So I apologize if it feels like I'm glancing over your question or answering it too simply. Um, as I've done, uh, other people have said I've kind of been too simple on the answers, but I think many people have some of these common misconceptions. So I, I think it is a common misconception that if you have uh, something like a uh, perfectly drawn uh, helicopter, let's say, perfectly drawn helicopter that the, <laughs> the helicopter when it create when it when it uh, lifts off it is pushing off of some surface and that could be uh, water 
or it could be something solid. But that isn't what's happening. What is happening is that the rotors here, the wings, let's say, for sake of simplicity, are forcing air past itself. And by bringing air past the rotors, it's moving mass past itself and away from itself at high speed. That is enough due to the conservation of momentum to create a reactionary force called thrust that moves the, helicop the helicopter up. The helicopter is not pushing off of the ground. It's pushing the air down, which forces it up. This is the exact same thing with rocket launches. Rockets do not push off of the ground. They just throw uh, mass away from themselves very quickly. And by pushing mass away from them, and you know, using chemical energy to create like a controlled explosion, to throw fuel away from yourself fast enough, what you do is you create a force upwards in the other direction. So rockets are not pushing off of anything. They're kind of pushing off of themselves. Same, same thing, helicopters don't push against the ground. They push against air, which forces them upwards. They don't need anything underneath, of, uh, they don't need anything underneath them for them to take off, in theory. You know, un unless you stop and you have to land somewhere, but you know. You know how it is. So I think that's a common misconception. I hope that gets at what you're talking about. And I think that I'm correct. It's been a while since Physics 102. What's next? From Ghost Hack. Ghost Hack. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> Let me get into the mainframe. No, who is it? It's a Ghost Hack. Not, not again. <laughs> that's what you remind me of. Sorry, what? Before The Expanse, mm. what was the best example of a good science in a science fiction show? I realize that I'm forcing myself off the screen here. Um, before The Expanse, which, uh, which if you are in the Atlanta area next week for Dragon Con, I will be moderating the science panel for The Expanse. Who knew? So come down, fist bump me. It's more hygienic. Uh, but before that, what was the best scientifically accurate sci-fi show? Hmm. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest, I, I, I'm not a big TV watcher, and until The Expanse, I wasn't really binging or watching any TV regularly. Um, uh, I think some of the best sci-fi on TV is, you know, uh, I think Rick and Morty is brilliant, but not for the accuracy part. Um, and if you go way back, I think TNG was really good, even though it had a bunch of techno babble. I think, I think it was interesting in what it was trying to do. But for scientific accuracy and recent... Um, uh, oh, um, Orphan Black was pretty good with genetics and cloning and, and things like that. Obviously, a lot of it was over the top, but uh, Orphan Black was quite good. Uh, so that's something that I would recommend. What's next? From Winter Last. Ooh, Winter Last. What is the easiest way to end Earth? Hmm. The easiest way to end life on Earth as we know it is... Uh, to, I don't know, if there was a way to um, do something so slowly to the planet that nobody seemed to notice what was going on, maybe a few people were picking up on it, but no, the population at large didn't really know, or if they knew, they, don't really care, they didn't really care, and it was a long kind of moving disaster, a moving catastrophe that, uh, you know, maybe in a hundred years would only start to really affect the population. That's climate change. That's what we're doing. That's probably uh, the easiest way to uh, affect global change um, in a supervillain kind of way without, you know, something like launching all the nukes on the planet or forcing Yellowstone to erupt or something like that. Uh, the unfortunate truth is, is that we're doing something like that to ourselves right now. It doesn't take... I love this. I hear this on my local uh, NPR station. It, it doesn't take much, but it does take all of us. So keep that in mind. Do what you can. Because it, it is the greatest threat to humanity, full stop, right now. That's my, <laughs> that's my two cents. What's next? I'm going to be forced off of the screen if I do any more sciencing. From Goddess Astrola, would gravity manipulation be a superpower you would want or not? gravity manipulation being a superpower. I, I can imagine that would be really, really cool to change the direction of someone's weight at, at, at any moment where, um, you know, uh, someone was coming at you and you, uh, you, you, made, you made the mass of a nearby, uh, oh, hmm. 
you made the mass of a nearby building so great instantaneously that it pulled them in that direction or something like that. It would be kind of a form of telekinesis, which is one of the powers that I've never been able to really wrap my mind around. But if you were to create local regions of extreme gravitational interaction, then that would be very, very powerful. I, I theorized, I don't know if it really works, but I, I, theorized, I theorized once that that was kind of how all the powers on Mass Effect in, in the Mass Effect series, the fantastic sci-fi video game series, Mass Effect by Bioware, does. Um, if, they were, if you were able to uh, spontaneously create regions of, let's say, dark energy, uh, or, or dark matter, rather, sorry. Uh, so matter that didn't interact with you know, normal matter, but it had a gravitational interaction. We know this happens because some galaxies don't spin correctly. They don't have as much mass as we see. Um, and uh, they have more mass than we see, and we theorize that dark matter is in there somewhere. So anyway, if you could create a local region of dark matter, maybe that if, if you created enough that didn't interact with anything else, it would create a force towards it kind of like the Earth's surface does to your body. And that would be very powerful and very cool. And possible? I don't know. We have to figure out what those, those, uh, those two things are, dark matter and dark energy. And I don't, once that happens, whoo, I don't know what's going to happen. What's next? From Casper K. Casper K. Kyle, do you think we may progress to the point of human-machine fusion, example, the beyond, like human brain and robot body? Hmm. Uh, I know that uh, what you hear a lot of uh, tech types talking about are the dangers of you know, brain-machine interfacing BMIs, uh, creating narrow and, narrow and then general uh, artificial intelligence. Um, but for re we've done real brain machine interfacing with, uh, we've done tests on say chimpanzees where you're able to wire something into their brain and they are able to quickly, not, not like in a year, but like in a few days or a few weeks, uh, learn how to manipulate a robotic limb by training themselves to use the, what they're thinking about to manipulate something uh, artificial. So that is something that we are doing right now. I, I, I can, it, it, I mean it's, with the best prostheses that we have right now, it's kind of the same thing where it's reading, uh, where it's reading electrical signals in your body and moving the limbs accordingly. So I think we're closer to those things than you think. But um, to have it any kind of uh, hyper advanced stuff like augmenting the way you're thinking uh, or um, you know your vision or something like that, that is much much further off. I think it's going to be more prosthetics before it's anything inside of the brain. And just think of think of all the testing that you'd have to go through just to make that happen. I mean, one good clinical trial takes years to do. So we are at least years off of anything quite like that. I think. Um, one more? Or yeah, one more. one more. Last one. All okay. right. From Meow Indeed. Hmm. Meow it. That's right. What is the most annoying science myth that fiction perpetuates? The most annoying science myth, uh, oh, uh, that fiction uh, perpetuates, the lone genius. Um, from Einstein to smart boy Isaac Newton, um, any, any, any great thinker throughout history, they rarely, if ever, operate in a complete vacuum. They are not doing things completely by themselves. Science is a progressive body of knowledge that builds on the work of others. It's a collaborative process that anyone, anywhere, anytime, of any background, um, uh, of any you know, parentage, of, you know, anyone can do and come to the same conclusions if you're using the same method. So the lone genius is a myth. Even people like Einstein, they build on others' work and they work with them. Um, humanity, is is uh, is the genius rather than just one person or one dude? Uh, science builds on itself. That's what makes it so powerful. And that's all the time we have for this edition of Because Science Live. Thank you so much for watching. If you are on YouTube, go back and like and subscribe to this channel because we do a lot of other fun nerdy stuff here. Not just these live streams, but also vlogs and the main episodes. And if you want more of that kind of content, you can go to alpha at projectalpha.com and sign up for a free trial where you can get the main episodes like Goku and his weighted clothing two days before everyone Else. Also, you can follow Because Science on Instagram and Twitter. And if you are in uh, the Atlanta area for DragonCon, I'll be hosting the Science of the Expanse panel. So come check it out. We have 
a number of the main cast, uh, four of them, in fact. So it's going to be awesome. Uh, so I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Have a great rest of your day. And be kind to each other because this is all we got.